Howdy! Welcome to our talk show where today we are honored to have Jorge Bermudez join us uh, from actually today from Austin, Texas. Uh, and he's going to talk to us uh, about his time uh, both in Aggieland and his career beyond, beyond that. Uh, Jorge was a, a student in the College of, of Agriculture here uh, where he studied agricultural economics and business. And he also made the vast majority of his career at Citibank. And he has real insight into innovation at both Citibank and the financial sector overall that we will, we will discuss, among other topics. So, Jorge, welcome. Thank you. Thank you very much. Great to be back in Aggieland. So, uh, so Jorge, why don't we begin with, uh, tell us how, a little, a little bit your, your, your background, how you came to A&M, uh, wh where you grew up, if, if, if you don't mind. Uh, yeah. No, it's a long story, though, but <laughs> I'll, I'll try to shorten that. Um, I'm originally from Cuba, and so I came to the United States when I was 10 years old uh, with my brother, and we went to live with a foster family in California. We eventually reunited the families, uh, and, and my father began working with the Inter-American Development Bank out of Washington, D.C. And so I finished high school in Bogota, Colombia, at the international school there, decided that I wanted to study um, agricultural economics, and so I came to Texas A&M as a result of the recommendation that uh, one of my father's colleagues, who was an Aggie, uh, but I had never been to Texas, yeah. never been to Texas A&M. I knew very little about the school. Uh, in fact, it was quite a shock when I got here and found out that there were very few females in the <laughs> school, and there was primarily a military school. Yeah. Uh, so that's how ignorant I was of Texas A&M at the time. But that's how I ended up here. And mm. uh, I can't say it was love at first sight, <laughs> but certainly over the four years I came to enjoy my life here, made lots of friends, and uh, uh, felt I got a very good education out of Texas A&M. And just curious, your, your childhood in Cuba, I mean, that's, that's unusual. Can you tell us what that was like? Do you remember of... Uh living in, in, in a society like that? Yes, uh, I actually remember a lot of that. Uh, we had, my father was a banker in Cuba, but we also owned a ranch. Uh, and then we had the revolution. Yeah. Uh, Castro was trying to topple a dictator who was extremely corrupt. And so he received a lot of support from the population in Cuba, including my family. Uh, but I remember as a child uh, playing in the backyard and listening to shooting going on by, because uh, there was a revolution taking place. And actually one time I was playing with my soldiers in the back and uh, a, 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 an airplane came strafing by. Uh, they were strafing a, a, a fort that was down the road from where we lived. Uh, my mother came out and picked me up and brought me inside. but. During that time, I used to have to, all our family, we, we slept in mattresses on the floor because there were shootings going on and you never knew where, where a stray bullet might come. So it was, it was an interesting, interesting part of my life. Wow. Uh, we spent a year and a half without electricity. Wow. Because Castro had cut the power lines to the city we lived in. So it, it was interesting, exciting. But as a child, I found it to be uh, uh, fun in many ways. Okay. How old were you when you left Cuba? Ten. Ten, okay. Yes, I left okay. without my parents. We I came see. here, just my brother and I. Okay. Under okay. a program called Pedro Pan, Peter Pan, where right. they took out 14,700 children right. without their parents right. uh, and brought them to the U.S. to be either with foster families or in orphanages around the country. I see, I see. Interesting, interesting. Now, now let's uh, fast forward to your time at, at Texas A&M. So uh, I'm sure you didn't know many people when you, when you came here. You weren't part of many communities that sent a lot of students to, to the A&M. What was that like for you? Well, my arrival here was, was it was difficult, yeah. to be very honest yeah. with you, uh, especially because I had never been to Texas. Yeah. I certainly had never been to College Station. College Station was extremely different uh, then from what it is today. 
um, beginning with the fact that all students seem to go home on the weekends, uh, but I started making friends. Yeah. And uh, one of the things that I found out early on was just how, how good uh, Aggies can be and Aggies can be to each other. Uh, my first day here, I walked out of the housing office with two trunks. It was the 4th of July of 1969. And I got lost. I didn't know my way to my dorm. Uh, and I ended up at Northgate up at the uh, post office. And I was supposed to be down by Duncan Hall yeah. in the southern part. And this, this young man in a, in a truck stopped and said, are you lost? And I said, you don't know how lost I yeah. am. <laughs> And so he took me to my dorm, uh, and I, that, that <laughs> began my, uh, my uh, understanding of how Aggies help each other and, and just, frankly, what a wonderful school this was. Right, right, right. Uh, let, me, let me give you, uh, ask you a pointed question. Tell me the, the best and the worst of your time at A&M. The best and the worst. Uh, I, would, I would say the best was probably the fact that as I matured here, I was given the opportunity to mature. I, I have to say that when I arrived here, I was probably quite immature in many ways. And uh, I received uh, a very stern warning from the dean of the uh, College of Agriculture, uh -huh. uh, Dr. Potts, who sat me down after my second semester and said, you're not the man we thought you were when you were admitted to A&M. Um, and it, there, was, there was a conversation that seemed to last a century. I'm sure it didn't last <laughs> that long. Uh, but at the end, he said, we're going to give you a second chance to see if you can be the man we thought you were. Uh -huh. He says, and I've met your father. I know the man he is. Uh -huh. But that's not the man you are. So uh -huh. let's see if you can prove to us. Uh -huh. That I catalog as the best because it actually was an educator who took the time to give me advice and put me on notice that life was different. I was here for a purpose. The purpose was yeah. to get an education and do yeah. something better yeah. with my life. And so, I, I, even though it's a very stern talk at the time, he changed my life. Huh. Uh, I became a serious student and I was yeah. able to do the things that I should have been doing from the beginning. Right. So I catalog that as the best. Okay. Uh, the worst, frankly, was probably my first semester um, living in an on-air conditioned dorm <laughs> in July and oh, August right. and September. Uh, very hot uh, and not knowing people at that point and finding that the campus would empty out every Friday. Uh -huh. and not having friends initially, that transition is very hard. Uh, sure. So I would actually catalog that as probably the worst part of my experience at A&M. Okay, okay. Now, now tell us about your, your transition to the working world after A&M. How did you get your first job? What did you, how did you identify uh, banking as an area you wanted to pursue? Uh, I wanted to be a banker. Um, okay. Since I was a child, I remember visiting my father's bank in Cuba, um, and then later on, uh, while I was in high school, uh, and liking what happened in a bank, uh, liking as I learned more about what bankers do and how they help in the development of, of economies and people and companies. And so I wanted to be a banker, but I loved agriculture. Mm. And so I tried to marry the two by uh, majoring agricultural economics. Yeah. Uh, and that's, uh, I found that to be the right balance because there's so much in agricultural economics that's really applied economics. It's taking economics and applying it to markets, commodity markets, but it is applying that knowledge to markets. And I enjoyed that a lot. Um, when it came time to get my master's degree, I decided that I wanted to go into agri-banking. Uh, so I was able to work out with the College of Agriculture 
so that they would allow me to take a majority of my courses in the business school, uh, that accounting, finance, management, etc., uh, that would help me achieve the goal of becoming a banker. Uh, as a result, uh, Citibank uh, had just started an agri-commodities department. Uh. And it was, it was populated by, uh, Citibank was a New York Center bank, and most of their, in fact, all of their employees uh, and officers were uh, people who had been educated either with an MBA from one of the uh, Ivy Leagues or, or from the University of Chicago, but they had no one with a true agricultural background. Uh -huh. So they came to recruit at A&M uh, as a result of the, the relationship our department head had with the head of that department at, at Citibank. Uh -huh. And they came down, I interviewed, and uh, there were like 15 of us that were interviewing. I thought I had a very bad interview, but I guess it was good enough, and they reached out and hired me. So I actually became the first Aggie to be recruited and uh, actually make it through the executive training program of a money center bank. Uh, so. I was, I was very proud of that. It also showed me, by the way, something that for me became very important, and that is I had a Master's of Agriculture degree from the College of Agriculture, and I was competing in the training program with MBAs from, like I said, the University of Chicago and uh, the Ivy League schools. And what I learned very quickly was that the education that I had received at A&M was the quality of education that allowed me to very effectively compete with the other trainees mm -hmm. who came from better known schools at the time. Because Texas A&M at the time, sure. Cork, was not as well known nationally right. as it is today. Right, right. Wow, and, and was that, uh, was your first assignment in New York City? Was it was, yes. So the very different, again, very transition from <laughs> College Station to New York. Yes. I don't know if that different is that difference greater now or smaller. I guess. Uh, would you say it's it's probably smaller today because uh -huh. we're a much more interconnected society yeah. than we were at the time. Yeah. Um, so the transition was probably more difficult at the time, but it also taught me something. I, I sometimes I'm asked to speak to. How do you, what are the differences, cultural differences that allow you to do business around the world? And one of the things that I learned early in my life when I was 10 was coming to another country, having to learn a language, and having to adapt to a culture that I was completely unfamiliar with. And that helped me along in my career uh, when we had, when I had to move to various countries. I've lived in numerous countries and done business. In, in 104 of them, uh, but it helped me be sensitive to what, how important a change in culture is and how different cultures can be. And there was no question that coming out of College Station in 1974 right. uh, and going to New York City at the time was very different from, from what I had learned up to that point. And so you've spent your entire career at Citibank. Uh, yes, that, which yes is, I did. Which, which today I think seems almost very unusual, if not impossible. Uh, so obviously that's a long career to unpack. Uh, maybe tell us about those, those early years. What, what were you doing? What, what divisions were you in? Well, I started my career in the Agri Commodities Department in New York City. Yeah. Um, and we were basically, the, the, the charge was uh, being a relationship manager to commodity companies like uh, Cargill and Continental Grain, et cetera. But we were starting an effort to go nationwide so that we could reach customers uh, across the country. So two years after I, was, I started in New York, they transferred me to start the agri-commodities office in Houston and covered the southwest part of the United States for Citibank. And 
that was a great experience uh, because it showed me how important and what are the critical factors when you're starting a business. We started with zero customers, zero revenues, and just an expense base. And we had to figure out how to create a market, how to create prospects, and how to convert those prospects into customers so that those customers could begin to generate revenues for the bank and make our office viable. And that was an extremely important lesson that I learned early in my career uh, in terms of making sure that you begin to understand customers' needs well enough when frankly many of the customers didn't even know what a Citibank was. Uh, so that was an early experience that helped shape my career I a lot. I, um, I did that agri-commodities for the first five years of my career, and then I was transferred to the uh, what Citibank called the uh, Institutional Recovery Management, which was the area of the bank that restructured uh, major companies that were in trouble. Uh, you're too young to remember, yeah. but there were companies like Pan Am, uh, which was in trouble at the time, right. uh, Macy's, Johns Manville, Rio Tinto, which were all major economic groups, but they were, they were in trouble. They had borrowed too much and they couldn't repay. And so, again, at a very young stage in my life, I was probably at that time uh, 28, 29, I was given responsibility for some major, major workouts of companies where you had to sit across the table with 140 other banks and negotiate new terms and try to restructure the companies so that they could actually survive, mm. uh, which is truly financial engineering at its best, right. trying to find what is the healthy core of a company that you can then build around so that it can then begin to repay bondholders or, or debt holders like banks uh, and still provide some return for shareholders. So I, it's, it was pure corporate finance and I just, I enjoyed that part of my career tremendously. Uh, I got the opportunity to go overseas. I spent uh, a year and a half in Spain, spent time in Mexico and then mm -hmm. I was transferred full time to Venezuela to run the Corporate Investment Bank uh, of Citibank in Venezuela, uh, which was again a very good experience because at that time the countries in the developing world were going through their debt crisis. And so we had to restructure the debt of sovereigns. Uh -huh. And again, I learned a whole new facet of finance, which is understanding government's finances and how to restructure them, keeping in mind the societal pressures that governments feel and need to support together with the need to repay what they have borrowed. And so that was also a very exciting part. So that took care of probably the early part of my career. Now, just uh, I got to check if I have the financial history correct. Uh, for most of your career, uh, we were under U.S. banks were under this regime where there was a separation between the commercial and the investment banking. Yes. And then I think '99 was where that that flipped. So, uh, what was uh, and you've been at Citibank kind of over both horizons. Uh, do you have any any thought thought? Does that Im did that impact your career at all, or did you? It, it, it did in a way that before 1999, uh, although we had the corporate and investment bank businesses inside the bank, we kept Chinese walls yeah. between the two so that we could still do our commercial banking, but we were able to also provide uh, certain, not a full breadth, but certain investment banking services and products so that the customer could achieve their goals dealing with primarily ourselves. Right. 
Uh, there, of course, were situations we couldn't do M and A. Uh -huh. uh, so there were certain restrictions that kept the two apart, uh, and we ran them as distinct businesses right. uh, versus merging them together, which is what happened in 1999, which was, by the way, as a result of yeah, that's right. the creation of Citigroup, right. which was the merger of Citibank with, at the time, Travelers. Uh, and I don't, I don't know if you know this little bit of fact, but the, uh, the, the sen one of the senators who, were, who was behind that act was Phil Graham, who yes. was an A&M economics professor. Uh, that's, that's very yeah. true. Yeah. That's yeah. very true. And I, I, I do know, I, uh, I don't know him well. I've met yeah. uh, uh, Senator Graham. Yeah. Uh, but yes, he was one of the instrumental forces behind right. that. Right. Uh, in 1998, when Citibank and Traveler started talking about merging, yeah. it was illegal. Yeah, it was yeah. an illegal merger yeah. uh, because of the Glass-Steagall Act. Uh, but the two, institute, the two companies approached the Federal Reserve, the Treasury, uh, Congress, and the White House and got approvals to merge with the, with the proviso that if the law wasn't changed, they would have to divest of a number of businesses right. uh, if the merger was allowed to happen and the legislature legislation was not changed. Yeah. Yeah. So yes, that was 1999 then creates the fusion right. of the two businesses. And so uh, you, uh, you kind of rose up the ranks uh, to, through the, did you ever mention about the, the risk officer, is that right? I, I, at various times in my career, yeah, times, yeah. uh, I went from running businesses to uh, being a risk officer for a certain uh, geography or group of businesses, and then back to running businesses. Okay. So I, I went back and forth between uh, business and risk. Okay. And then you all, so from 99 till your retirement in 2008? 2008, that, yes. So that was uh, a very interesting time, right? After <laughs> the, I guess, kind of the start of the first internet bubble to the financial crisis. That's correct. Yeah, so can you t tell us about, about those years? Well, I can tell you that um, I, I, I spent the majority of those years in the business side of the business, yeah. uh, as opposed to risk. Uh, but, you know, if, if I look at my career, we lived through a, just in, in my, I was with City for 34 years. If I look at my career, we had the, the developing countries crisis that yeah. almost bankrupted a number of banks. Uh, we had the savings and loan crisis, which did bankrupt yeah. a large number of institutions. Uh, we had the banking crisis in Texas, which created a lot of turmoil in the financial world here. Uh, we had the real estate crisis in the early 90s with the mortgages. Then we had the tech bubble the, the in 2000. Right. Um, and then the financial crisis in, in, in 08, oh, actually, actually began in 2007 and blew up in 2008. Uh, so I had a chance to see a number of these financial uh, disruptions in the market, uh, which created both risks and opportunities, uh, which is the way you have to look at, right. frankly, markets, right. is uh, wherever there is volatility, there's risk and there's opportunity. And yeah. the critical part for people who are playing in those markets is to determine where's the risk, understand the risk, where are the opportunities, and take advantage of the opportunities. Now, let me, let me actually uh, pivot the conversation a little bit towards uh, innovation in, in the financial sector. Yes. Um, if you want some water, please feel free. Thank um, you. The, uh, the, I, I was actually in, uh, I don't know if you knew this, but I was working in the, the Bush White House in 2007, 2009. I was on leave from the University of Chicago and I was uh, on the Council of Economic Advisors. 
And I'll tell you, up until the point I, arri I arrived in July of 2007, and essentially bef for maybe the five years before that, you know, sh Chicago was, uh, it, it was, still is, very much the hotbed of financial economics. And financial my, my, my wife tells me that all the time. She has an MBA from Chicago. She so does, She right? tells me that all the time. That's exactly <laughs> right. That's exactly right, yeah. Um, the, the view then was that the financial innovation in, the, in, in Wall Street through securitizing risk was unambiguously good. That was essentially bright. That's what I was essentially taught at the lunch table at Chicago before I got to Washington. And then once I got there, essentially in July of, uh, of 2007, is when credit spread started blowing up, the debt market started collapsing, and then eventually the equity markets. You were in uh, at Citibank during that time. Uh, I'm just curious about your view of the of that of that specific financial innovation. Did you uh, did you know about what was happening at the time? Did you see it happen? Was anyone w worried about uh, the downside risks? I mean, I know it's hard to look into the future at any point, but back then, how how was it back then? You know, financial innovation is always to me is positive. It's how that innovation then gets implemented and, and used. Um, I would agree that what was happening was actually very positive potentially for the markets yeah. and for the economy and for society. When it's taken too far is when problems, it's when a problem begins to take place. Yeah. And Many of the financial innovations that you are making reference to were abused in many ways. Yeah. They were abused by, by investors, they were abused by banks, uh, and, and the crisis of 08, which began in 07, is a perfect example of how that can get abused. Uh, some of those securities and securitizations that were being sold to the market uh, were being structured in ways that would by nature create a problem if, in, that, in this case, the price of real estate was ever to come down. Right. Uh, banks were creating these securities they were doing the securitizations and they were selling it to the markets. Investors were not truly understanding what it was that they were investing in. Yeah. They weren't really doing the in-depth homework that needed to be done to understand the true underlying risks of the securities that they were acquiring. Even banks were missing some of the underlying risks that ultimately they ended up paying a very heavy price for. Yeah. Uh, one critical component, for example, is you have, you have market rules. Yeah. Banks were able to create the securities and hold them but they were supposed to be held for a period of 90 days or less yeah. before they were, you have to then sell them to the market. Yeah. So you're only holding them as you gather uh, interest from investors to come and buy that pool of securities. Yeah. What many banks unfortunately started doing was going beyond the 90 days and holding these securities for longer periods of time collecting the interest that the securities paid and being very relaxed about actually laying them off into the market. Or when they actually did sell them, they were selling them with, with uh, repurchase agreements that they would take them back if there was a problem. Yeah. And that created then, when real estate markets initially began to collapse, the price of real estate began to come down. Many of the pricing models that were being used for those securities had never taken into account a decline in the price of real estate. Yeah. They had factored into their models 
at the worst case scenarios, a flattening of the price of real estate, but never a decline. And so that started creating then major losses. Right. So okay. I don't blame the innovation. Uh -huh. Innovation is always good. Yeah. It's how you then apply that innovation that creates either a benefit or a problem. So that was obviously a very unique uh, point in time in financial history, and I know some of our students uh, may, may have been too young to really understand what was what was happening. I highly recommend you you learn about that. There's several several books written about uh, about that time the, during the, right during the the, the the aftermath of the financial crisis. Uh, from your vantage point, what um, I, of course hindsight is twenty twenty. Always. What what could Citibank have done different in that during that time in dealing with those or that that innovation or the marketplace? You know, it's it's interesting. When I was the chief risk officer of Citigroup, I went to a conference um, in London during the '08 time when the crisis was beginning to occur, and. Uh, one of, it was the, 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 the Basel group, yeah. uh, and one of the, I won't mention the country, but one of the central bank presidents uh, uh, who had responsibility for overseeing banks, I gave him a presentation on the nature of the crisis at our institution. Yeah. And one of the comments he made to me was, had you seen some of these uh, problems beginning to occur and taken some action, you would have been vilified by the markets uh -huh. because you wouldn't have been taking advantage of the revenue growth right. that other institutions were taking who were taking that risk. Right. He said, and that's why bankers are doomed to always be lemmings. <laughs> Uh, if you know what lemmings are, they're little <laughs> creatures that go off a cliff following each other every so often. Yeah. Uh, but there was a very interesting comment because yeah. to your question, what could we have done different? There were a number of things that as I became chief risk officer yeah. uh, in the middle of the crisis, yeah. uh, I began to see that it should have been obvious yeah. in many ways. Yeah. Uh, but to have taken action at that point would have meant giving up on revenue opportunities yeah. that every institution was taking advantage of in order to maintain the kind of earnings growth that the uh, equity markets pay for. So there are lots of things, yeah. and maybe that's a topic for another conversation, yeah. but there are lots of things in fact, some of the things that I would have recommended uh, pre-crisis, uh, but it's a hard thing to do. Yeah. Yeah. Our, our chairman at the time made a very unfortunate comment uh, in July of 2007 when asked about the potential crisis and what the Citibank's uh, view was and he made a comment uh, that's been quoted in every newspaper. Uh, we'll keep dancing as long as the music right. runs. Right. Uh, right. Uh, <laughs> you know, that, that was an un unfortunate comment. Yeah, <laughs> yeah uh, that's a famous comment. Yes, yeah. yes. Yeah. And, you know, from my, my perspective, we were, uh, when I was in, the, in the, the Bush White House, dealing with, uh, working with the Treasury Department, on the response to the, the crisis is, uh, as you know, there was um, there was a lot of talk in the press about whether uh, some some banks are too big to fail and, yes. and uh, the government's response to those banks. I'm just curious, from your side, uh, uh, what was the uh, what was the, the sentiment from 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 Citigroup? Was there ever a conscious discussion about uh, how the government would respond, given that you are Citigroup, uh, a major if not the major, you know, consumer bank uh, in, in the country, was was that? How did that factor into any of your decision making? Well, uh, let me first say, it didn't factor at all into decision making pre-crisis. Right. So along the way, right. as a banker, you're never thinking of, I'm going to be bailed out by the government, because right. there's a cost to that. It's 
a big cost to getting bailed out right. by, the cost, by the government. And so uh, it would be very unhealthy to view that as a means of uh, taking risk. So that was not something that was thought about at the time. Yeah. Uh, even during the crisis, I don't think we ever sat down and said, the government's going to bail us out. Yeah. Because that was actually very unusual. Right. And as you know, right. eventually when it did happen, yeah. it's a very unique set of circumstances. Uh, the thought always was, how do we raise more capital? Yeah. How do we raise yeah. the capital we need in order to withstand the potential losses that are built into our balance sheet? Uh, so government bailout was not a strategy mm. ever. Mm -hmm. Um, and I think when it happened, uh, which it, it happened with a number of banks, not just Citigroup, yeah. uh, but when it did happen, it came with a very high cost attached to it. Right, 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 right. Well, that was, wow, that was, uh, you, were, you were right there in the, in the middle of things. D d did you leave uh, Citibank in 08 related to the crisis or, or was? I, I was leaving Citibank in 07. 07, okay. My, my agreement at Citibank was that I would, at Citigroup, was that I had informed them in 2007 yeah. that I was going to take early retirement in yeah. 2008. Yeah. Um, when our chairman resigned in 2007 and the board um, released the chief risk officer of the company, uh, the board approached me and asked me if I would take over as chief risk officer. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, I didn't want to at the time right. because <laughs> the crisis was upon us. Yeah. But uh, eventually I, I did take the role, um, but with one agreement. We didn't have a CEO or chairman at the time. It was an interim chairman. And so the agreement that I had was that if the new CEO, uh, once he came in, he or she at the time, once they came in, if if we were not in agreement, I say tie at the hip, if we were not in agreement over what the strategy that was necessary to bring the bank out of its uh, problems, if we couldn't agree on that, then I could still exercise my early retirement option. Uh, when the new CEO was hired, mm -hmm. um, he was already an employee of Citibank. Citibank had acquired his hedge fund. Yeah. Uh, it was Vikram Pandit. Right, right. Uh, he came from a hedge fund. Yeah. Uh, and now he was CEO of the largest bank in the world. <laughs> right. Uh, so his views uh, and mine on what needed to happen to correct many of the risks and problems that we were facing were very different. Of course, yeah. And we could not find common ground uh -huh. over a period of months uh -huh. uh, as to what should be done and could be done. Uh -huh. And so when I realized that this was not going to be something that would be uh, practical for me to be able to discharge my duties, I opted to take early retirement. Well, that seems like y you were walking into a difficult situation uh, becoming chief risk officer at a time at the beginning of the crisis with an interim CEO and not having been the chief risk officer during the time when many of the decisions were made leading up to the crisis. It seems like an almost impossible situation to be in. It, it, was, it wasn't easy. Yeah. Uh, it was a challenge. Yeah. But you know, I had spent my whole career yeah. at this institution. Yeah. And I had a tremendous amount of loyalty to this institution, and that's ultimately what led me to accept uh, the, the role of chief risk officer. If I could still help this institution solve its problems, then for me, that, that there was a level of satisfaction in, in doing so. 
Let me now uh, uh, move the conversation up to the present. Um, uh, some of the hottest topics today are Bitcoin and blockchain and its potential for, uh, for changing the financial sector. Uh, we have an annual, uh, at the Maze Innovation Research Center, which is hosting this, uh, this show, we have an annual Bitcoin conference. Uh, I just returned from the Texas Blockchain Summit last week. Um, do, you, do you follow the space? Are, are you, uh, are you, do you have opinions on how, uh, how radical this innovation will be for traditional banking? Uh, any, any thoughts you want to share? Well, at one point in time in my career, uh, in fact, it was from 99 to 2002, I was responsible for innovation at Citigroup. Right. That was my role. That's right. And so innovation has always been something that has been of extreme interest to me. Yeah. Uh, when I do follow it, yeah. I'm not, I'm not going to call myself an expert, but I do follow it. Yeah. And I think, frankly, there's a lot of debate about Bitcoin, the value of Bitcoin, of other cryptocurrencies. Uh, I don't know if you know this, but El Salvador right. has, you know, recently right. uh, made Bitcoin their national currency yeah. uh, in addition to the U.S. dollar. A lot of debate in that country going yeah. on right now about that. Yeah. But to me, the most important part of this is actually that the underlying technology that drives cryptocurrencies, the, 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 the blockchain technology, to me is what has potential to completely change uh, financial systems, financial industries, the kind of services that are provided, not just by banks, but by exchanges. What role does an exchange then have? Uh, so yes, I see that as what I like to call, and, and it's known as, a disruptive technology. This is something that will disrupt uh, markets as we know them. And to ignore that, if you're in the financial world, you're ignoring it at your own risk because ultimately, I think it has the potential to displace many of the businesses that, that financial institutions have that create a tremendous amount of, of revenue growth for them. Interesting, so this is, this is a first order uh, disruption. Is, is there anything else on the horizon that you see of equal or greater potential? Or would you say that it's, it's blockchain, blockchain, and blockchain? <laughs> well, I also believe, and this is, this is a personal opinion, that we're seeing the infancy of, of blockchain, yeah. okay? Yeah. I, I think we're seeing a technology that has a tremendous amount of uses and that will be further developed uh, over time to create disruption, not just in, finan in the financial world, but uh, elsewhere in business. Uh, so it's going to continue to develop. It's not that blockchain today is a technology that has a beginning and an end. We, we're probably in very much in its infancy. Yeah. You know, and, and it's got its own challenges like energy use. Yeah. Uh, how do you, you know, what, are, what can be done to improve that? Uh, so there are, there's a lot more to come and like I said, I think whether you're a regulator, whether you're a financial institution, or whether you're an investor, to ignore uh, blockchain and stay on top of the developments uh, is, again, you're doing it at your own peril. Uh, one thing uh, I wanted to just, uh, just coming from the Texas Blockchain Summit uh, last week is that Texas in particular is is orienting around creating some leadership in this space. Uh, both our senators were uh, at the summit. Um, and I think primarily, f first because, uh, you know, this really is Bitcoin country, and, uh, and Bitcoin, which created the first, the, uh, the, uh, the original blockchain, uh, there's a big mining operation uh, in Texas. A lot of the, the exodus of the Chinese miners are moving to Texas because of our, 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 our infrastructure. And uh, I think there are a lot of benefits to balancing out the, the grid here in Texas. Uh, but you're right, we're, we're right at the beginning. So for the finance students uh, or others watching, uh, make sure that this, I think this is, I, I believe this is an in, definitely an industry and a trend worth investing in as a young person today. Uh, uh, absolutely, I, I think. I wasn't at the conference, I wish I had attended, yeah. but I was not there. Uh, but I think your words are, are absolutely true. In part of my career, I was responsible for the uh, 
transaction services business and yeah. payment systems at yeah. Citi. Yeah. And I remember in 98 when we started to develop and innovate and created a, a, a completely new way of delivering s products and services uh, in the payment space uh, because it, we were going from a very old architecture to a web-based architecture. Uh, and I remember how we struggled to get the investment dollars we needed to create that, and yet we eventually got it. We innovated. Our, our, our delivery system was, was unique in the financial world at the time because it communicated and cleared with 104 central banks around the world. Right. It supported 77 languages. Yeah. Uh, it was, and I know the kind of disruption that that made to that particular sector of the business. Uh -huh. We grew our profits uh, tenfold in a matter of four years. Yeah. Uh, and I know what blockchain can do to that business if institutions are not looking at how to make use of this technology for their own benefit. So uh, I, yeah. I, I agree completely with your words. Yeah. And I'm glad to know, which I knew, but I'm glad to confirm that Texas is, is taking a leadership role in that. Yeah, yeah. Now tell me about this, this a uh, little bit more about this innovation uh, group that you advise at, at, at City, City Group. What was the, it was a department or you were, you, it was a committee to, no, it, it, I was made responsible for innovation, um, probably because we were architecting and designing yeah. something, and at the time, an internet strategy. The okay. internet was in its infancy in uh -huh. 1998, uh -huh. especially for, for banks and financial institutions, and we were devising a whole strategy on how to take advantage of that technology. Uh -huh. But the, uh, I became the head of innovation for the company. Okay. But you have to be very careful when you do that because it's innovation happens with individuals. Right. And in fact, one of the biggest risks you run when you're innovating is that if you bureaucratize the process of innovation or you overregulate the process of innovation, you you are you're putting a cap on it. You're yeah. you're, you're not going to innovate as efficiently and effectively. And so one of the things that I did not want to do when I became responsible for that was to create a formal structure and process that would discourage innovation wherever it happened to be. Yeah. So what we started doing was coordinating. At the time, city had a presence in 104 countries. So. What we did was coordinate with all the countries new ideas. Didn't matter how small or big the idea might be, we were surfacing that so that it could be discussed at the right level uh -huh. and determine whether we were going to place the funding and the resources to then grow that idea, make it eventually a product or service and then be able to commercialize it. Mm -hmm. So that was the purpose of what we were doing. I put together a team uh, to be able to take advantage and understand all of the different innovations that were taking place around the world within the Citigroup world. Uh, and, and by the way, yeah. uh, there's a lot of talk on the benefits of diversity, et cetera, these days. Yeah. And I have to tell you that the team we put together and the efforts we made, having diversity within that group, whether, you know, and, and diversity can be defined in many ways, sure. but having people who don't just have the same background, who come from a homogeneous culture, but who are rather understanding of the way things work differently around the world was extremely valuable mm. because you don't just focus on one idea. Right. You actually have a richness of ideas that populate the group. It is a difficult start because at first, when you have a group of diverse people trying to communicate, 
maybe they don't speak the same language, maybe they have different backgrounds, different, uh, uh, th their studies are different, they come yeah. from different cultures, but once they gel, the output of ideas is much richer than when you have just a completely homogeneous group. Mm. That aligns very well with what we've seen. Uh, some of the, the best successes of universities are collaboration across disciplines. And, uh, and fun, you know, a lot of absolutely. innovation happens right at that boundary. Um, so uh, I guess, uh, Jorge, that's been very, very interesting. In our, uh, you know, you've, you've had a great uh, run of service to Texas A&M. Thank you for that. Both you. as, uh, as uh, on the foundation board where you chaired it for, uh, for some time, as well as for the Associ Association of Former Students. Uh, tell us, uh, f especially to the, the students in the audience, uh, what, what parts of your A&M education were the most useful to you? What parts uh, did you f get the most value out of your entire, from your entire career? You know, Kark, if I, if I might, um, there is, w and, and this is different for everybody, but what I found in my career that I used every day and that it became part of the way that I think, uh, and even through today, it's probably my understanding of economics. Mm. Okay. Because one of the things that I have come to learn over the years is that understanding how economies work, understanding the, e the economic factors that drive markets, drive decisions, becomes very important. And so I'm not, I'm not negating the value of finance, which I use a lot, right. or accounting, which is what allows you to understand finance. Right. Uh, to me, accounting is like the grammar that allows right. us to understand the language of finance. But economics is an overlay that allows you to understand why things are happening in a particular way and allow you to then, understanding that, forecast and look forward uh, to the future as to what the outcomes may be. So for me, okay. the economics background that I had has been extremely helpful. I'm happy to hear that as, a, as an economist myself. <laughs> um, so let me, l my last question for you, Jorge, is if you had to put yourself in the, pers the shoes of a student today, what would you tell them, what life lessons would you offer, or career lessons, if there was one thing you would tell them as they launch off into this uh, brave new world today, what would you say? Um, hmm. You know, there, there are a couple of things that I would say uh, are critical. Always be informed. The risks that ultimately come out and bite you are the ones that you didn't understand. And so never learn at the surface. If you truly want to be effective in whatever discipline you have, do your homework. Be able to understand and drill down on whatever decision you're having to make. Don't just assume something. Make sure that you understand what is behind whatever decision you're trying to make. Understand it in depth. There are many people who can speak the language and they make a career out of just knowing all the terms and speaking the language, but they don't take the effort to truly learn what are the business factors, uh, what are the economic factors, uh, what are the social factors that affect what you do. So don't stay at the surface of issues. Drill down and understand them so that when you make a decision, you may eventually get bit by a risk you didn't see, but you've minimized the number of alligators that are out there that can actually bite you. The last thing, maintain your integrity. Integrity is binary. You either have integrity or you don't. And if you ever put a value on your integrity, excuse me, if you ever put a price on your integrity, you have violated integrity. And so 
use that moral compass we all carry inside when we know we're about to do something that's not right and pass it over because it's not worth it. Thank you, Jorge. Thank you for the, the very interesting uh, conversation. We covered a lot of ground, and I wanted to thank you again for all you've done for Texas A&M and for taking time to speak with us today. Thank you very much, Cork. It's a pleasure. It's a pleasure to be here. It's a pleasure to be able to chat with all of you. Okay, great. Thank you. See you next time. Mm -hmm.